we're here this evening uh, to do a video uh, telling the story, a love story, a great love story in Tralee, in County Kerry, in the in Ireland. And we want to bring you um, the story of the Rose of Tralee, a love story like no other. We're here at what they call the Rose Wall. It's a, um, a wall dedicated to the story of the Rose of Tralee, the continuing festival for many years. And I'm joined by Emma Hussey. And some years ago, the festival, the modern day festival committee um, asked us to do um, a story, the story, a tour of the story of the Rose of Tralee. And uh, Emma and I uh, researched the story and we tried to separate fact from fiction. Yes. Yeah, and uh, Emma and I are going to take you on a tour of the story tonight. We are here at the Rose Wall and as you can see in front of you the story uh, that was inspired by the love story of the Prince and the Pauper, Mary O'Connor and Willem Pembroke Mulchinock. And Yes, Emma. I suppose the love story as great as any love story, such as Romeo and Juliet, such uh, a tragedy. And you couldn't really write it, Emma, and it's no. based on a, a true story. And we're going to take you on a journey around the town of Tralee. It's up there. So, as we take you on a tour this evening, we will be showing you, I suppose, historic sites that are a part and are essential to the Rose of Tralee story, where Mary O'Connor and William Pimber Bolshev would have walked. Um, back in their time. We're here in Ash Street in Tralee, uh, which was at the time of our story was known as Nelson Street. And the there for many years there has there have been rumors and stories that the song was not written by the of the song of the Rose of Tralee was not written by Willem Pembroke Mulchnock at all. It was written by somebody else and somebody did claim so we'll clear up these little mysteries for you in the course of our our um, three-part video uh, during the second part we'll we'll deal with that whether or not Willem Pembroke Mosnock wrote the song the Rose of Tralee the story behind the song is certainly true so we'll uh, we'll talk about that later now I'll ask Emma just to set the scene uh, in Tralee in the 1930s and 40s. So as we stand here and look across the street, the buildings we are looking at remain largely unchanged since the time of our story. The story of the love affair between the merchant prince and the pauper. The property of the town was mostly owned by the gentry. Some of this property was bestowed on them for their services to the crown. They were the Collises and Sands who, become to be, who married to become the Collis Sands, the Dinnies, the Batemans, the Chutes and the Talbot Crosbys. The gate of this church, in fact, came from the Talbot Crosby estate in Adfert when it was broken up. They were also the Stauntons, Pembrokes and the Latchfords. Many, the, many of these important family names still exist by way of place names. We of course have Dinny Streets, Tubes Lane, Batemans Green, Collisand's House and Hoffman's Terrace. There is also Mulchnock's Corner, not, I'm afraid, named after the hero of our story, but the last Mulchnock family to live in Tralee in the 1980s. The list of names goes on. All of the houses where the common folk lived were owned by these families and a number of absentee landlords. Most of the commerce of the town was also run by these families. There were textiles in which the Mulchnocks were involved. Many of the families were involved of their export of their own goods and the import of anything that would fill their ships for the return journeys to Ireland. The railway had not arrived to Tralee, so the main mode of transport was on foot or on horseback. Some wealthy enough may have had their own horse-drawn carriages. Marconi had yet to invent the radio and there certainly wasn't television. We will now journey on our way through the story which inspired the song and today's international festival, The Rose of Tralee. Now we'll deal first with the Mulchinock family and we'll travel on Emma. We are now outside what was formerly the Munster Warehouse in Tralee at the top of Denny Street. It's on the Castle Street de Mall. Uh, junction in, in Tralee where the Pembroke and Mulchnock family ran their vast uh, property and import export empire. 
Uh, Emma, will you just remind us of the the song, a uh, verse of the song that inspires the whole festival and is central to our story, please? Of course. So the pale moon was rising above the green mountain. The sun was declining beneath the blue sea when I first met my love at the pure crystal fountain that stands in the beautiful Vale of Tree. So we move on, Emma. We're here in Clohars, or we're here in Ballard, in uh, just south of Tralee on a hill overlooking the town, which is a residential area. A lot of the houses here were built uh, in the 40s and 50s. However, it was here Willem Pembroke Mojnock spent the first years of his life, the first decade of his life, was his living with his father and, uh, and mother. And the house is marked with a plaque stating how important the house was in the whole Willem Pembroke Mojnock story. The Mulchnocks were a wealthy merchant Catholic family who lived in Tralee through the 18th, 19th and into the 20th centuries. They owned a large store in the centre of the town from where they ran an extensive export and import business. They exported linen and woolen products which they produced themselves in their own mills. They also had property interests. One of the other merchants in the town and a family who would have been of the same social standing as the Mulchnocks were the Donovans. The Donovans, who, whose main products were made from grain, which was used to feed the grain-hungry British Empire. The Donovans were also on the guest list to meet Queen Victoria, dubbed the Famine Queen, when she came to Clarny in 1861. Ireland had suffered severely from the potato famine in the years before and after her visit. This mention of the Donovans goes to demonstrate the standing in the community in which the Donovans and the Mulchnocks stood. The Donovans were the family who owned the Jenny Johnson famine ship the replica of which now stands in the Docklands in Dublin as a tourist attraction. When ships sailed into Tralee with goods from all corners of the globe, the Mulchnocks would fill them with goods such as linen and woolen products for their return journeys. All of this trade took place through the port of Tralee and laterally to the Tralee Ship Canal, which was opened in 1846. The Mulchnocks ran their vast business and property empires from their home in Clohers House in Bellar, just outside Tralee, which we will visit in the next few minutes. The family, in the family there was Father Michael, who died in 1829, Mother Margaret, three boys of one was which, William Pembroke Mulchnock. He was named Pembroke after his aunt's husband, who was also his godfather. Pembroke is buried within the confines of the nuns' convent chapel in Carcel Tralee. A prominent street still bears his name, Pembroke Street. William, his mother, two sisters and two brothers, who on the death of their father, moved to their uncle's house, Clohers house, where he was later to meet Mary, O'Connor, the first rules of Tralee. We're here now in Clohers in Ballard and we're looking at the former residence of the Pembroke family where in 1929 after the death of his father Michael 18, 18, 18, or 1829 <laughs> I keep making that mistake Emma. I'm glad I have Emma the youth on my side to remind me uh, in 1829 when on the death of the father uh, Michael, the family moved here under the guardianship of their uncle. The, this was, uh, of course, one of the great houses of Tralee with long driveways. And what kind of a lifestyle did they live here, Emma? Well, I suppose they really enjoyed all the trappings associated with a family of their class, such as coachmen, gardeners, farmhands and servants, which included governesses, of course. And among the servants was the mother of Mary O'Connor, who actually worked as a dairy maid in the house. And this is where William uh, Pembroke Munchnock met Mary O'Connor in later years. And Mike, would you remind me, whereabouts is the Crystal Fountain? The Crystal Fountain by? actually is the... Uh, when we were growing up in the 60s, now I'm at this, these were green fields and uh, some several fields, maybe half a mile, two fields down the road is the pure crystal fountain mentioned in the song The Rose of Tralee the first verse. and uh, it's in the first verse. Uh, have you the first verse there Emma? Can you do. remind us of what it says? The, um, so I think it begins, the pale moon was rising above the green mountains, the sun was declining beneath the blue sea 
when I first met my love by the pure crystal fountain that stands in the beautiful Vale of Tree. Of course, the crystal fountain, Emma, we'll visit at later in our story. It is story. more relevant to the love story as we pick it up later on. The um, That's where the household got their water and the servants would frequently go to the fountain and bring back water for the main house. We'll see it at a later stage in the story. We're here now in Brogmakers Lane in Tralee, which has changed immensely since the time Mary O'Connor lived here in the 1840s. We've given you um, a little flavour of what the Mulchtenock family was like and what they represented in the town. We are now in the uh, area, uh, the birthplace of uh, Mary O'Connor, the first Rose of Tralee who Willem Pembroke Mulchtenock fell in love with. When we are doing the Rose story tour of the town, Emma and I, we come here and we, uh, Emma asks people to close their eyes and imagine what it was like. And Emma, will you describe the street at that time? I will, of course. So when Mary O'Connor lived here, um, you could, children at play could be heard from afar. There were at least 100 children living on the street at the time. If you could imagine the smell, the houses had no running, running water or sanitation as we would know it. People would routinely throw pans of water and other household wastes into the then dusty streets. You could hear the clucks of chickens and the oinks of pigs in every backyard, with the odd one running, with the odd one or two running around with children chasing. With that, the sound of dogs barking, the banging of tools while men worked outside their houses, making and repairing all kinds of things, mothers calling children and women shouting at men who had taken drink could be heard. As much as we try to recreate in our minds the scene, it is almost impossible to do so. But this might have given you a flavour of what it may have been like when Mary O'Connor lived and played here. Mary O'Connor was born and lived here in Roguemakers Lane in the heart of Tralee Town. The lane, as it was then and is still locally known as Rogue Lane, was a street of thatched houses in which lived many of the artesian tradespeople, such as tailors, butchers, carpenters, chimney sweepers, but mainly brogue makers. Working for the Mulchnock family, Mary's mother was able to secure a job for the then 13-year-old Mary in the house in Ballard as a scullery maid. Mary had some formal education from the presentation nuns who lived near Brogue Lane and whose mission it was to educate the poor. We will visit the plaque in a few moments. Mary was well capable of reading and writing, which would not have been the case for many of the staff at Cluhers. This enabled Mary to be promoted to children's nanny at the age of 18. She was tasked to look after the children of William's sister, Maria. It was during this time that William began to notice the now beautiful young woman that Mary had become. It was during the following years William had fallen in love with Mary and she with him. Members of the family had noticed the change in the relationship between the two. Dancing at the crossroads in Clahan and hand-holding walks to the pure crystal fountain two fields away from the house became a feature of their evenings together. There was an unease in the family at the way things were developing between Master William and the servant girl. There was much talk about the relationship and talk of ways to resolve the situation were discussed. The relationship caused a bit of a stir in the polite society in the town. It was the stuff of much gossip. We are at the bottom of Brogue Lane, where this mill belonged to McCowns, one of the merchant families in Tralee, still stands to this day. And we're looking up Brogue Lane, of which Emma spoke a few moments ago, where Mary O'Connor lived. The, there were probably up to 150 children or more here in the uh, 90 or 100 houses that were here up until the late 1940s when the tenement buildings here were knocked and the house was, uh, the street was rebuilt to uh, make room for St. John's Park in Tralee and the people were moved to places like Stacks Villas in Tralee and Casements Avenue in Tralee and other places where no housing schemes had been built. So we're here just outside the presentation plaque who were the educators of Mary O'Connor um, whose mission it was to educate the poor. So I'll now read the plaque and it says on the site the first presentation convent was founded in Tralee on July 9th 1809. 
a small room with damp flags served as a classroom, refectory and recreation room. S Sister Joseph Curtain and John Sheehy, accompanied by Rev Cornelius Egan, all from Clarny, made this foundation. And it was here that Mary received an education that was not afforded to many of the servant classes in Tralee at the time. This was the beginning of the presentation involvement in Tralee. I believe you're a presentation girl. I um, am, yes, just like Mary O'Connor. So, as well as your age, you have that in common with Mary O'Connor. Yes. yes, okay. <laughs> the next part of our story brings us here to Denny Street in Tralee, and at the top is the shop where the Pembroke Mosnock family ran their business from and uh, we are here in Denny Street and Denny Street except for the traffic hasn't changed much in the intervening hundred years. The uh, houses across the road were 10 or 12 years old at the time of our story here and uh, we're, there are two, the building at the end of the street, the Thomas Ash Memorial Hall was not here at that time and neither was the Pikeman Monument. But other than that, uh, little has changed here, especially in the opposite side. Maybe a little colour added. And the year we're talking about is 1844. And of course there was nobody on roller skates in those days. We're here under one of the arches and the uh, picture of the... Who did these, Emma? joint project between the three main secondary schools in Tralee so I think it was between Presentation, The Green and Mount Talk and it, pro it might have been the Gwail Cloucester as well Yes. and there so it was a project done I think in, back in 2018 it was over two years ago. They are actually fabulous murals uh, showing the old Denny Street as it was in the time of our, our story and we'll continue with the love story between the uh, William Pembroke Mojnock and Mary O'Connor. So, on the 18th November 1844, Daniel O'Connell, the Liberator, arrived in Tralee for a rally to gain support for the repeal of the Act of Union. William Pembroke was a supporter of O'Connell. O'Connell, who for the most part travelled on horseback, was met on the outskirts of the town by many of the trades and professions, carrying ornate banners. Among the gathering were carpenters, painters and brogue, maker, brogue makers, accompanied by several marching bands. The procession also had in its ranks seamen from the many boats docked in Tralee Bay, men who had been ordered by their captains to attend as a tribute to the Liberator. Extensive reports were published about the event in the national papers of the day. The Kerry, Man, the Kerry Examiner, The Nation, The, Tr the Tralee Chronicle put, put the crowd at about 60,000. O'Connell addressed the crowd from the first story window which we see across the road here of number 12 Denny Street, the house owned by a Miss O'Connor. The estimated 60,000 strong crowd filled Denny Street. The Pikeman Monument, which now dominates the street, did not exist. The street only went as far as the last house in the block. At this time, Denny Street, which was about 20 years old at the time, it was impossible for many of the crowd to hear the oration given and some of the attendants may not have even seen O'Connell, such was the size. You can imagine some more than halfway up the street were only getting a commentated edition of the speech. Someone would say, what did he say? And someone further up would repeat, would repeat what was said. Mulchnock stood outside his shop watching the excitement created by O'Connell's visit. Amongst the crowd were many who had opposing view to O'Connell's. Scuffles broke out, which for the most part consisted of shouting and jostling. Outside Mulchnock shop, William was drawn into an affray with a group of those who had favoured the Union. One of the opposers, opposers was injured before the group was disbanded by a group of police. It is said that William was later accused of assault as a result of the affray. The situation did not seem to worry William though, as he was enlisted among the attendances at a banquet held to honour the Liberator in Tralee Town later that week. The banquet was attended by the great and good of Tralee's high society, many, many from the legal profession and parish priests from all the parishes in the county and beyond were in attendance. We are here in Blenable, in outside Tralee in the ship canal, here in the rotating drawbridge that opens up the ship canal to the 
wild Atlantic way, the Atlantic Ocean. So the urgency of William's plight took a turn for the worst when a senior member of the local military called to the Mulchnook's house to warn of William's impending arrest for assault. Again, we believe this was part of a great plan to get William away from Mary. It was all a subterfuge cooked up by the family. To flee, William then boarded a ship here in Chile Bay which was waiting on the tide to turn. The ship was bound for India with supplies for flour for the war effort. On reaching India, he worked at one of the few jobs for which he was qualified, a war correspondent for one of the British newspapers sending regular dispatches about the India campaign. After a number of years, Mulchnook began to feel the pangs of loneliness and homesickness. This was not helped by the fact that his regular letters home to Mary were not receiving any response. Unbeknownst to William, his letters to Mary were being intercepted by family members and not reaching the target of his affections. Mary, on the other hand, was left with the impression that William had forgotten about her and their romance. Join us for part two and when William returned to Tralee to again be united with his, the love of his life, Mary O'Connor, in the, we will cover that. And we will, of course, deal with the, separate the fact from the myth of William Pembroke Mochinock and the song, did he write it or did he not?